Thank you very much for inviting me, Pavro, and Jin Dobre. Um, yeah, I, I sort of uh, tend to point out to people that uh, I got my PhD around the time I first became a grandmother. So uh, if, you, if you're late, a late starter like me, don't despair, there's still time. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, um, first of all, a bit of the, the background to how I came into this field in the first place. Um, and then about sort of two fields of, of research which have proceeded in parallel and I think along very similar lines, although they've generally been treated. So people who work in color perception seldom work in, in facial expressions and, and vice versa. So they have been treated as very separate lines of research. But I think there are so many parallels between the two that uh, it w in order to propose different explanations for each of these lines of, of findings, you have to be uh, really stretching a point a bit. So I think it's very likely that at least some of the factors that influence color uh, categorization also influence the, the categorization of facial expressions of emotion. So I'll, tr I'll try and explain in the course of the talk what I mean by that. But to, to give you a bit of background into both fields of research, the, the origins of both fields are about sort of 50 years old, and in both cases they've involved a nature-nurture debate of where do these categories for, for colors and categories for facial expressions come from. Um, and in both cases, it's, there is one sort of camp that has strongly proposed that these categories might be innate, they might be inborn, um, they might be fixed within our perceptual system for some reason, and there's been another camp that suggested that they are largely culturally determined and possibly related to the language that we use to name categories with. Um, so these two lines of investigation have, have largely proceeded in parallel to each other, but without very much contact between the two. So generally speaking, they're done by, by completely different groups of researchers. But both of them, I think, have contributed to our understanding of the relationship between culture, language, and perception. And I'm suggesting that it's culture that influences um, our, our categorization in both fields rather than language, because language is the tool of culture. People name things that are important to them in their culture. So for instance, there is a, a group of people living in the Amazon basin in South America who have, I believe, more terms for uh, insects and grubs and uh, caterpillars than, uh, than zoologists in the West have. But at the same time, they have only one word to cover all moths and butterflies. Why? Because they eat the caterpillars, but they don't eat the butterflies. So they, they have the larger classification vocabulary for the things that are important to their culture. Um, and, and I think that, that it's, it's culture that's driving these effects rather than language per se. The language is the tool of culture in the sense that we just name the, cult, the categories that are important to our culture. So the, 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 the nature argument, the, the sort of, uh, it says the nurture argument, but I meant the nature argument, which is what happens when you get to my age. So for, as far as colors were concerned, was put forward originally by Berlin and Kay, who did, produced a sort of seminal monograph in 1969. And what they proposed was that there were a set of 11 color categories, and these would be black, white, and gray, red, green, blue, orange, yellow, purple, and brown. Why those ones in particular? Well, conveniently, they happen to be the ones that are considered to be basic in the English language. And surprisingly, in 1971, when Ekman and Friesman proposed a universal set of six basic categories of facial expression of emotion, those also happen to be the six basic ca categories of facial expression that are considered to be basic in the English language. Now, that both of these were proposed by uh, researchers who happen to be speaking English on the west coast of the United States may not be a coincidence entirely. But both of them were based at the time on comparisons of, of Western uh, US undergraduates uh, and some uh, participants from pre-literate cultures. 
So the hypothesis for color was based largely on Eleanor Roche's uh, work with the, the Dani in Indonesia, who were a group of people who uh, reportedly had only two terms for color, one that covered all the dark and what, what we would say cool colors, so green, blue, uh, some of purple, um, yellow, um, so, so sort of div devising on the lines of all the dark colors plus the, the, the cooler light colors and all of the sort of warm red-based pink uh, colors and, and all of the light colors. So there was this sort of division of, of the whole of the color spectrum into, into two categories. For facial expressions, it was based on, uh, a, again, a, a tribe of uh, preliterate pre culture in Papua New Guinea that Ekman and Friesen had visited, and what they had found was that despite having very few words for facial expressions, uh, the people in this culture seemed to match the expressions uh, along the same lines to do the, make the same matches that, that Westerners made. So there was, however, perhaps a problem with these in that in both cases the available choices of stimuli were very restricted and favored the best examples of English language categories. So um, here the, uh, the best example of red happens to be on the edge of this set, so does the best example of pink, uh, the best example of yellow, sort of either, either that one or that one, I can't remember which. Uh, the best example of blue is somewhere around here. Um, but all of these colors are very very bright, very saturated colors, and I don't know if that comes out on the screen very clearly, but... Uh, and here are the, uh, the original set of stimuli that Ekman and Friesman used. You'll notice that all of the faces were white. Um, and why does that matter? Well, if you look at these, these are photographs that I took in, in Namibia, uh, working with the culture there, as you'll notice, there are not many saturated colors in the natural environment there. So although that set of colors may have been very familiar to English speakers who lived in a, a landscape where, with a, a lot of um, manufactured goods and uh, dyes that were very saturated colors, for people in a lot of uh, preliterate traditional cultures, it may not have been the case that they had a wide experience of very saturated colors. And uh, the other problem, of course, is that for a lot of those people, they would not have seen a white face before. So the researchers and the stimuli they took with them may well have been the first white faces they encountered. So I think, although at the time, uh, both sets of research were treated as, as very uh, novel and interesting results, if we were doing that research now, the first thing people, would, other researchers would do was question the use of those kind of stimuli because they'd be very unfamiliar to the participants. So in both cases, the argument was that the, the matching choices that they made or the memory, um, in, in the case of the color stimuli, they were asked to look at a color, remember it, and then pick it out from that large array of colors after a 30-second delay, um, 30 seconds is quite a long delay, um, and the task was very difficult. But in both cases, um, the similarities between the participants from the, the traditional cultures and, and the US culture were considered to be strong evidence that these categories were universal and independent of whether they were named or not. So even though these cultures didn't have names for the particular color categories or for the facial expression categories, they seemed to make similar choices uh, to the US participants. And this was taken as evidence that these are cognitive universals that are independent of language and culture and possibly innately specified. So the suggestion for color certainly was that actually this might be the way our color vision system is set up. Um, and that, that, that we actually perceive th these colors categorically in the first place. So in our perceptual system somewhere, uh, as yet undiscovered, perhaps somewhere in the visual cortex, there might be cells that respond particularly to pink or green or blue or yellow. 
Um, in both cases, although the arguments put forward were very similar, they, they were treated as unique cases. So um, the, the argument for colors was that they might be hardwired into our color vision system. And therefore, of course, this would be a completely unique case. You wouldn't expect to find a similar case for any other set of stimuli. Um, and in the case of facial expressions, it was argued that it's so fundamentally important to humans to understand the facial expressions of others because it allows you to predict how they're going to behave, predict their moods and so on, that this is so fundamentally important to human behavior that this again would be a completely unique case. And nobody drew any parallels at the time between the two sets of evidence and the fact that the arguments being put forward in each case were really very similar to each other. So the alternative viewpoint was put forward actually quite early on, um, but was dismissed for quite a long time um, and has been put forward much more forcefully more recently that the experience of participating in different social practices might lead to both temporary and long-term culture-specific perceptual tuning. So this is the idea that possibly um, the, the, the way that we learn to experience things within our culture might determine a set of categories that, that are important to us and that we, we then perceive and recognize and remember. Now that, of course, leaves room that there might be variation between different cultures, so some cultures might uh, recognize more categories than others, um, some, some cultures might recognize less, depending on what's really important to them. And that certainly in the case of color allows for the possibility that uh, if you grow up in a culture that doesn't have manufactured goods, that doesn't have uh, availability of, of highly saturated dyes, you might have fewer color categories, both in perception as well as in language. Um, and uh, Melissa Bauman, who sadly died a, a few years ago, but uh, was a, a strong proponent of the suggestion that um, language is a driving force in determining, in maintaining the categories that we uh, recognize and, and um, use in our culture, and that it's potentially catalytic and transformative of cognition. So the idea here is that, that we use our language to drive the, the, the way that we perceive and understand and divide up the categories of things in the world. So the question is, how important is this? Supposing we did do things differently. Supposing that speakers of, of Chinese or Korean, um, sorry, go back to that. Uh, well, there we are. Supposing that it really does affect the way that you see the world, that you really see the world in different ways. Would that mean that it, because somebody like Pinker would argue that this would be catastrophic for human understanding, because it would make it impossible for us to understand people from another culture and the way that they, that they understand the world. Well, I would disagree slightly. For instance, and I usually give this example, I know that the French have a word rose, which means roughly the same as I mean when I talk about pink except that I know that there are some examples of colors that French, a French speaker would call rose that I would not call pink, and some examples that I would call pink that a French speaker would not call rose. So there are, there's a wiggly bit at the edges, but basically it's roughly the same thing. And I think that generally speaking, speakers from different languages and different cultures can accommodate the fact that sometimes categories are only approximately overlapping, and you know that they're a little bit different, but that doesn't matter. So I don't think it's necessarily catastrophic if we see the world in different ways. And that's roughly sort of where I came into the, uh, the debate um, some time ago. So it's this question of, is it, is it, would it really be catastrophic if we did do things differently? Because the argument that these are universal categories and we have to do them in the same way is based on the, the, the assumption that we couldn't possibly understand each other if that were not the case. So my research has focused on how people categorize these two particular sets of, of, of 
things in the world, colors and facial expressions of emotion, um, because they're quite easy things to test, it's quite easy to set up tests to, to, to do with uh, um, remote cultures. Um, it hasn't in the past involved hauling large sort of sets of equipment around, although uh, more mm. recently we have done uh, EEG and, and various listening experiments and things with uh, um, participants from traditional cultures. So we've got uh, used to the idea of hauling around um, electrical equipment and computers and things like that, even though in very sandy conditions you're always a bit uh, wary of whether your laptop's going to last the, the course. So the particular aspect that I've looked at, because for, for a variety of reasons, is something called categorical perception. Um, it's a very useful thing to look at because it turns out that uh, this is a phenomenon that most participants experience and this is the idea that uh, if you have, say, a set of colors, I can explain it later for facial expression, things like that, some of them will be named the same. So you can get two colors, for instance, here that I hope everybody here will agree with me that both of these would be called the same name. I would call them both green. I don't know what the... Uh... Thank you. <laughs> Okay, here are two that I think I would call different names. Anybody disagree that those are different categories? Okay, so I'd call that one green and that one blue. And these two here I would call blue, so they would, they would in English, get the same name. Um, I don't know whether that's the case for Polish. Would they be named the same? Yeah? Okay, so we've got a, a within-category pair here that would be called the same, a cross-category pair here that would be called different names, and a within-category pair here. And the general finding for these is that if I give you one of those stimuli to look at first and say, remember this one, and then I give you two to look at and say, uh, which one of these did you see before? You might have some difficulty in remembering whether it was that one or that one that you saw before, or remembering if it's that one or that one. When it comes to these two, you'd be much more accurate. You'd find it very easy to say, that's the one I saw before, not that one. So even if I equate the physical separation of two stimuli so that the distance between these two is the same as the difference between these two, you're still going to be more accurate at discriminating this pair than you are at discriminating that pair. So that's the sort of the basic premise of categorical perception, is that in some way these are not equivalently matched, even though the physical separation in color between the two might be the same, or indeed you can manipulate it so that the physical separation of the within category pair is actually greater uh, than the physical separation between the, the cross-category pair. And you still find that people are, find it easier to discriminate the pair that come from different named categories than the pair that come from the same named categories. So what's the catch here? The catch is that not everybody has the same categories. So, for instance, uh, I would call these ones green and these ones blue, and I'd call all of the, I would treat all of these as if they were equivalently blue. But if I was a Russian speaker, that would not be the case. So, and, or if I was a Greek speaker. So in Russian, you'd call the, the dark blue ones Sini and the light blue ones Goloboy. And in uh, Greek, you'd call the, uh, the dark blue ones Ble and the, the light blue ones Galatio. Um, Likewise, although I would call these ones all green, if I was a, a Barinmo speaker, I would call this one war and these ones Nol. And if I was a, a, a Himba speaker, I would call these two Ndumbu and these two Burao. So these are a, a range of, of different languages that have different boundaries within the same set of stimuli, which means that it makes it very convenient because it means that you can give people uh, memory tasks, uh, matching tasks, discrimination tasks, we're using the same set of stimuli. And if the categorization in language and culture matters to this discrimination task, then you should be able to get different results from 
the speakers of different languages. Um, so that, in fact, is what we found. So that we found that for um, these are Barinmo speakers in the, the primary rainforest in Papua New Guinea. And for them, this boundary here between these two, so these two were easier to distinguish than those two, whereas there was no difference for English speakers. Conveniently, for the same set of stimuli, the boundary falls in a different place for these uh, Himba speakers in northern Namibia. Um, and so they, they show a different boundary, and they find these two stimuli easier to discriminate than those two. And again, for English speakers, there's no difference. And for Chinese speakers, for whom they again, they all fall within the same category, there's no difference in the, ability, in the discriminability of those two stimuli versus those two stimuli. So from, from all of those different uh, languages and cultures where we went to, to do this particular uh, set of experiments, we, oh, sorry, that's come out really tiny, it should be huge. Uh, but what it's showing you basically, this is the, the pattern of, of discrimination for English speakers, the pattern of discrimination for Himba speakers, and the pattern of discrimination for uh, Barinmo speakers. And hopefully you can see that the accuracy levels for different stimuli are, are different across the, the three sets of languages. So from those experiments, which were fairly simple perceptual matching and um, discrimination tasks, what we found was that speakers of different languages who had different named categories, so the boundaries between their named categories fell in different places, showed different perceptual effects for the same set of stimuli. So that would suggest quite strongly that language and culture do have a, a strong effect on the way we categorize things. There was no evidence there that, that there was a universal set of categories um, that were independent of the way that they were named. So eventually this will move on. There we are. So this is this categorical perception, this uh, the, the uh, superior discrimination of, of categories that uh, of stimuli that cross a category boundary compared to those that are within the same category, doesn't just happen for colors, because it turns out it happens for facial expressions as well. So one of the things that you can do with uh, facial expressions is that you can morph between two photographs of facial expressions so that you can have uh, a photograph that in this case is, contains, I think, 90% of a happy face with 10% of an angry face. And this one contains 70% of a happy face with 30% of an angry face. Um, there is an argument as to why you shouldn't do this type of morphing. And the argument goes like this, that in the real world, you never see anybody who's got an expression that is 70% happy and 30% angry at the same time. Um, so uh, in, in subsequent experiments, we have used stimuli that morph from a neutral face to a, to a, to a happy or a, an angry or a sad expression rather than using these ones which morph between extremes. But if you do morph between extremes, you can conveniently get two faces that have sort of 30% separation but fall within the same category in that they're both predominantly happy faces and these two are predominantly angry faces. But these two, which have the same amount of physical separation as this pair or this pair, cross a category boundary in that this one is predominantly happy and this one is predominantly angry. You get the same effects in terms of uh, the, the discriminability of cross-category versus within-category pairs for facial expressions as you get for, um, for, for colors. So that might suggest that whatever argument you're making for one group, you should make for the other, for one set of stimuli, you should make for the other set of stimuli as well because the, the behavioral findings are exactly the same for both sets. So if you're going to argue that there's a different origin for the, the effect in color than there is in facial expressions, 
you're not using the, the most economical um, argument that you can you can find. And generally, sort of, we tend to think that the simplest explanation for things is is the best. Here's another reason why I think it's unlikely that the effect arises from individually. So it might be the case that we have um, in within our, our visual cortex, we, we have a, a color vision system that's set up to perceive colors categorically. And that completely independently of that, um, in terms of recognizing facial expressions, we have some innate system for recognizing facial expressions. Here's why I think that can't be the case. Because you can do exactly the same thing with face identity and get the same effects. But the face identity effects cannot be innate. It can't be the case that uh, we uh, recognize Tom Cruise and, and Jim, uh, Jim Carrey uh, innately. Um, so this is, uh, I think, 90% of Tom Cruise and 10% of Jim Carrey, and that's 70% of Tom Cruise and 30% of Jim Carrey, and this is the other end of the spectrum. And you find the same discriminability effect that people are better at discrim providing they know who the, uh, the end point faces are, they are better at discriminating this pair of stimuli than they are at discriminating either this pair or this pair. So you find the same categorical perception effect for a set of stimuli that could not possibly be innate. They must be learned. So if you're proposing that that this effect arises because these are innately determined, then you have to make, say that the same effect occurs for a set of stimuli that could not possibly be innately determined. And uh, just for fun, here are some uh, other um, blends that you can get. So uh, I think that is uh, what's known as Brangelina. It's a morph between Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. Uh, that one, I think, is George Bush and Jennifer Lopez. Uh, that's Mel Gibson and somebody else, but I'm not sure who. And that is Michael Jackson and not quite sure who the who who the who the, the, the female is. <laughs> um, but in fact, there are now lots of uh, nice. Uh, uh, little apps on, uh, if you have a, a, an iPhone or something like that, you can get a, a nice app that will morph uh, your face with your children's or um, the pop star of your choice or even uh, a species of great ape of your choice. So I think my point here is that um, the explanation that you would give for the categorical perception of face identities should be the same as the explanation that you would give for categorical perception of colors or facial expressions. And if it has to be learnt in one case, then why couldn't it also be learnt in the other cases as well? It's also the case that we'd have to accommodate um, some changes over development. So in the course of development, we know that from the time that children are newborn, they prefer faces that are top heavy in the sense of having more information available at the top of the, the, the face than the bottom. But actually, newborn infants are quite indifferent to whether the organization of it is that way round or that way round. And it's not until they're about three months of age that infants reliably prefer the correct configuration of facial features to uh, a sort of nice Picasso-esque kind of uh, setup like that. So um, if, it, if the perception of facial expressions is innately determined, then you might not expect changes like that to occur in, in, in the course of infant development. So that again is a, another argument for suggesting that perhaps our ability to perceive facial expressions is not innately determined. Um, We've done this in a number of ways. So originally we started with this pair of stimuli and people said, well, if you have the pair of stimuli side by side, you have to look at one and then you have to look at the other. And this is, which means that you have to carry one in memory while you're looking at the other. Um, so there's a memory component to the task where you involve a memory component to a task. You inevitably also involve, uh, invoke naming because it's easier to remember things if you if you name them, so you're, you're sort of artificially introducing uh, something to do with whether or not they have different labels for the, for the stimuli. 
So here is a, a task that has sought to look at the same thing by superimposing one of the colors on the other so that rather than having to remember two things side by side, you've now got both of them uh, within this, the, the same uh, visual framework. Um, and there's a whole lot of different uh, experimental tasks and experimental situations that have been used to try and minimize the extent to which labeling is required for these tasks. I've done some of these tasks requiring participants to make a continuous noise all the way through um, the experiment to try and stop them naming. So I made them say and, 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 through for, for a 10 minute experiment. Trust me, participants hate it. <sighs> it's, it's the worst thing you can ask them to do. Um, so, one of the arguments is that um, when you're labeling things, you name them one at a time, but when you're discriminating things, you're, you're required to, to judge two things at a time, to judge two colors or two facial expressions, um, so that uh, in the, and even so, this does not compare to what we do in the real world. So in the real world, when we're looking at making a judgment about what color things are, it's very rare that we would see things on a blank white screen and only see one color at a time. In the real world, we're looking at an environment that's very complex. Likewise, in the real world, when we're looking at facial expressions, it's rare that we see a disembodied face in a still shot. Normally, we see people moving around. We see body movements, we see body posture. 70% um, of, of, of the expressions, we, of the, the emotions that we express is supposedly expressed in body language rather than in facial expression. Um, so this kind of stimuli that we've used in the past for these experiments are very stripped down. They don't really resemble the sort of decisions that people are required to make out in the real world. So there is an extent to which you could argue that categorical perception experiments are very artificial. They may have some use, some limited use in the lab, but they don't necessarily tell us very much about what people are doing in the real world. Um, and so the, the question is, does the context in which you see things matter? Um, and arguably, yes, it does um, in a number of ways. Um, don't worry too much about this. This is sort of trying to explain why it might be the case that uh, um, these judgments might be, the, the cross-category judgments might be easier than the within-category judgments. So that, um, and it's, it's kind of rests on the idea that when you see two stimuli that come from the same category, but they're di so they're both blue, but they're different blues, you have two bits of information. So if I say to you, are these thing, two things the same or different? You're looking at two things that perceptually are different. So if you're judging them purely on a perceptual basis, the answer that comes back would be they're different. But if you're looking at them on a categorical basis, they're both blue, so the, the, the answer would be they're the same. So when I ask you to make a judgment about are these two stimuli the same or different, You've got two conflicting bits of information, perceptual information that tells you they're different and categorical information that tells you they're the same. And resolving that conflict between the two different responses takes a bit longer. If you see two things that are different, physically different, and they come from different categories, then in both cases, the, the, the response comes back that they are different. So, it's just, the, the argument would be here that the reason that you get this difference between the ease of discrimination of two, co two colors or two facial expressions that come from different categories as opposed to two that come from the same category is because in the case where they come from the same category but they're still physically different, you have to resolve the conflict between these two different responses. So that's the, 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 the argument as to why that it might be easier to, dis, to discriminate these. The argument is it's more difficult to do these because you've got to sort of uh, resolve the conflict between those two pieces of information. You also see priming effects. 
So it's context matters, not just in terms of what you see, but in terms of what you saw on the previous trial. So generally speaking, when we do these experiments, we give people a whole series of pairs of colors or pairs of facial expressions, and we carry on asking them the same question from trial to trial. And it turns out that it actually quite matters what you saw on the previous trial affects the way you make a judgment on the next trial. So it's quite easy to influence the way people attend to these two different bits of information. So you can make them prioritize the category or the physical separation. And if they, if they did one, made one type of judgment on the previous trial, it's going to affect the judgment on the next trial. So context matters in that case, in that, in that sense as well. So there's a lot of things you have to take into account when you're doing these kind of experiments. And the, the jury is still out, really, as to, to where the, the, the truth lies on that. Trying to avoid situations in which people name stimuli. Um, recently, people like Rachel Jack at Glasgow have done eye tracking experiments where they've simply asked people to look at faces and decide whether they have a, a, a neutral or a, 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 an emotional facial expression. And then they've looked at the pattern of, of the, the gaze that, that people use and come to the conclusion that Western Caucasian participants and East Asian participants are actually looking in different places to find the same information. Um, so the argument would be, yes, they make different judgments because they're taking different bits of perceptual information into account. But bear in mind that even here, you're asking them to make a judgment about, is this, does this face have an emotional expression or not? So, you can, you can make the, uh, the devil's advocate argument that all of these things invoke labeling. It's really, really difficult to prevent people from labeling categories. As soon as you ask somebody, is this, does this face show a, a, an emotional expression, yes or no, they're going to be looking for a labeled emotional expression. They're going to be looking to see whether it's happy or sad or angry. Or um, As soon as you ask them to judge whether two colors are the same or different, they're going, to, they're going to access their labeled categories. However hard you try, however much you try to gag them, people access their language. It's what we do. It's the tool that we routinely use to, to, to do any cognitive task. So why wouldn't we access it? Um, and people have come up with all kinds of, of tasks like this to try and minimize the extent to which people use language. But I think the argument is still a legitimate one that you can say, take all of that stuff and it's all down to the way that people are labeling things. But if labeling is so intimately tied up with cognition, if every cognitive task that you give people, they are using language and using their named categories anyway, if you can't separate them out in an experimental way, then perhaps you can't set, separate them out in life either. And if that's the case, then the way that you label things is the way that you, you, you perceive them, um, if you can't sort of separate the two. Um, another sort of uh, way that we've tried looking at that in terms of, of emotions is to look not at emotional uh, facial expressions of emotion, but uh, voc vocalizations, non-verbal non vocal sounds. So things like, ooh, ah. Ah! and getting people to judge, what, um, make a judgment about emotions um, with those. And again, the, uh, the evidence is a little bit mixed. So it turns out that if you ask people to listen to those from a, a, a again, as we asked the Himba, who are non, they, they have no written language, we ask them to make judgments and listen to these things through headphones. And give or take the two or three participants who tore the headphones off and ran screaming off into the bush because they thought they were hearing ghosts. Um, the, those who stayed and participated throughout the full experiment, if you made them to make a forced choice, so you said, listen to this sound, is this person feeling angry or happy? Then you got judgments that resemble the judgments that US participants made. But if you gave them a free labeling choice and just said, tell me how this person is feeling, 
you've got nothing like that. that. So again, it's dependent on how you ask the question to a certain extent. Um, we've looked at, uh, again, over the course of, of child development, and this work we've, we've done with uh, all with UK participants. So we took faces that, uh, these morph pairs of faces between different expressions. We've produced the same ones with uh, um, less information in them, so we put sunglasses or masks on so that we were removing part of the information that people would normally use to make those kind of judgments. Um, and what we found was that uh, for, by the time they're, sorry, by the time they're nine years of age, and for nine-year-olds and adults, um, they are better at making those decisions when they have the information from the whole face than when you take some of the information away by covering it up with sunglasses or a mask. But actually, for young children, for four-year-olds, they're better if their face has sunglasses on. So if you take away some of the information, four-year-olds find it less confusing. They're better at making those judgments. So there is a, even, if, even if you discount, if you lay to one side the argument that people from different cultures and different languages might be making these judgments differently, actually, within our own language and culture, Children are making those decisions based on a different set of perceptual information than the one used by adults. So there is a, there is a developmental change that occurs within cultures it, on top of the changes that you might observe between cultures. So for all of those reasons, I think it's the case that these are not innate and predetermined categories. It would be nice to think that uh, there is some optimal set of categories in the world. And it just so happens that I, as a speaker of English, am lucky enough that that optimal set is expressed in my language and I learn from a, from a young age. Um, and that other uh, speakers of other languages are not so lucky. But I, d I really don't think that's the case. And for all of the arguments that you can make that these are lab-based, fallible tasks that don't present the stimuli in the way that they're seen in the real world. I think there is little evidence out there as yet that these are, are in some way predetermined. So I'm, I'm with the, the categories come from what we learn through experience and that what's important to our culture and expressed in our language. So here's the, the sort of bottom line that I'm, I want to, to put forward. Is categorical perception tasks in the lab tell us what information people use to make category judgments in the lab? We've learned a little by studying them about how categorical information is coded and stored, but they don't really tell us how people use categories in the real world and the extent to which categories might be flexible and context dependent. Um, and even within adults, speakers of the same language may be used in different ways at different times. So I think we have to take on board that life is a lot more complex than, than a simple set of categories that could be innately determined. Um, is there still a research interest in the topic? Well, this is something I thought I'd look at because some of the stuff that I did and, and other people have done was done a very long time ago. And I thought, well, maybe this subject is just so complex that people are just given up on it completely. So I had a quick flick through uh, Google Scholar to see whether anybody was still doing uh, research on this. And do you know what? It turns out they are. So, and, and to quite a considerable extent. So um, thank you very much for, for, for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is a list of people without whom I couldn't possibly have done all of the, the, the stuff that I've done. And uh, I've had enormous fun uh, in the course of doing my research, and uh, what can I tell you? It beats working for a living. Thank you.